All right, we're in the interview portion of today's show. We are joined by a legend, voice of White Sox fans, childhood, my childhood, have learned more about the game of baseball. You and Steve Stone, we'll talk about it in a moment, but I got something for you. I've been waiting to do this a long time. I know you like to turn vodka into piss, <laughs> so here's a nice little bottle of Grey Goose. You can do as you please with it. Um, that's my gift from myself and White Sox fans to you for... All you did for us over almost 40 years. How, how long was it in the booth? Like 37? Uh, altogether, I, I was uh, announcing for 42 years. 42? Yes. I started off with Boston for seven years. And then uh, an interim there, I was with the Yankees for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. I came back to the White Sox in 82 and Drysdale and I were here. So I was with 30, uh, 34 years with the White Sox. Wow. It's been a lot of fun. Yeah. It's been a lot of fun. And I don't like how he cut me out of that nice gesture. Well, it's he's like, this is from him only in White Sox fans. Like, I'm sitting right here. But he describes you. Yeah, you want to see yeah, well, hey, well, I mean, if you turn wait, it up a little bit. It's 1030. That's yeah. not too early. Yeah. If we were on the golf course right now, I'd be cracking a beer. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, that's the champions of the breakfast, you know, a hot dog <laughs> yeah. and a beer. Oh, yeah. Breakfast of champions. But you had mentioned um your upbringing a little bit and in your mom and you talk about it a lot in your book now this book is your first way what you described as multiple copies or or versions or what are do you have a, a new book in the works or are you just hanging out what's hawk up to these i've days? had some people call me to do a, a new another book mm -hmm. and this is the second one i did one back in 19 and after i was player of the year and uh in 68, I uh, did one in 69 Okay, before I went to, to Cleveland. And uh, I've had some people call and wanted me to do another book. But it's not going to be – it won't be much different than this one because of the fact I'm not a kiss and tell guy. You know, <laughs> right. it's just uh, – I don't can, believe can in we all get that you stuff. to uh, retract that policy for the rest of this interview. We want, we want exclusively kiss and tell us the rest of this interview. Well, there, there's, I was telling him on the way out here. So I read it in a, in a, a day or so. And, and when we've talked to AJ Pierzynski, for instance, uh, we, we brought you up and this was a while back, but he Dennis described the you, menace. <laughs> that, oh, big time Dennis the menace, That's right. but he described you as like the real life, modern day version of Forrest Gump. And if you read your autobiography, you really are now, you met Frank Sinatra out in Los Angeles, I believe. Yeah, we had a golf tournament out there every year, in, uh, Palm Springs, and a baseball players tournament. And they had a, all the movie stars. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, my first two rounds, the first round I played with Clint Eastwood, and uh, then I played with, uh, oh, I forget his name. Uh, but they were big, big stars yeah. out there. Mm -hmm. And we had a great time, you know. And then Sinatra was there. And he joined us one day. We were sitting around telling lies, you know, and having some cocktails. And <laughs> so he comes over, sits down, and I tell you, when he walked in a room, everything stopped. Oh, yeah. It was like, I mean, it was like whew, froze. Everybody was yeah. frozen. Like God watched. Yeah. <laughs> exactly yeah. right. Yeah. You know, yeah. well, not maybe that. But <laughs> close. <laughs> and then the next time I saw him was down in Miami when Junior when Frank Jr. was doing a show down there at a friend of mine's uh, cabaret. And uh, I was sitting there, and uh, I didn't have my beautiful Greek wife with me. We weren't married yet. I didn't know her. And I had a date with me. And so all of a sudden, here comes Frank walking in with his entourage. Must have been eight or ten people. So he sits down maybe 15 feet from me and... Mm -hmm. Then all of a sudden, I got to go to the little boy's room. So I get up, and I'm, I'm not going to, you know, say hi, Frank, or anything, you know. So I get up, and I'm walking by. And all of a sudden, he grabbed me by the arm. He looked up. He says, you don't say hello to your friends? <laughs> I melted. <laughs> oh, yeah. What do you do there? The hawk became a pigeon. <laughs> i tell you. He was so he was just a great guy. What was it like out on those, on those golf outings? Was there money changing hands? Who, oh, yeah. Who, who, who was like? The most fun to play with. Who was the best? Uh, I was the best. You were the best. Okay. <laughs> yeah. He right. qualified for the British Open. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, Nicholas talked me into that. Jack, and, uh, after I retired from baseball, I went down to – I was living in Miami Beach. I was going – I was a member at Lagorce, and I was going out, and Jack and I were – Jack was a member there, too, because Jack Grout was his 
teacher. And Jack Nicholas and I were playing a lot of golf together, so uh, I'll never forget. I was playing really good. I mean, I was shooting anywhere from 64 to 70 every day, you know, and uh, this is in 72, and this is the year that Jack was going for the Grand Slam, mm -hmm. and he's on the tee, and I walk up, and, and I was, as I said, I was playing good, and I looked at Jack, and I said, Jack, I'm going to kick your ass today. And he looked at me, and he smiled, and he says, you just hold that thought because you won't have it long. <laughs> <laughs> did you ever – did you have it long? He was right. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Did, <laughs> he never took any money off of Jack? Holes. Yeah. <laughs> but he, uh, he says, you ought to go over and try to qualify. He says, you're playing too good. So I went over, and I played really good. I shot 138 for two days. I shot 70, 68, and led all American qualifiers. Wow. And some, you know, some tough weather. And then uh, – what course was it on? We, it was, we qualified at Galane, which is a sister course, to Muirfield, okay. where they were holding okay. the Open. Yeah. Yep. So I went to the golf course the next morning, and so Jack comes walking, and he says, who are you playing with today? I said, I'm not playing. He says, what? I said, I'm not playing. Jack, I can't hit any better than I'm hitting it. I said, you know, and that little redhead last night at the, uh, <laughs> at the restaurant, and going back to, to meet her, and he goes, bleep, uh, I said, I said, that's what I'm trying to do. <laughs> you know, and he, he says, come on, you're going to play with me. He says, you and I are going to play Yancey and Weisskopf. And Weisskopf is playing so good, it's just unbelievable. And he said he shot uh, 64 yesterday, he shot 30 the day before, nine holes. And uh, he said, I just want to see what happens the first time you hit it by him. So now I know what my job is. Yeah. Right? So Jack's talking with uh, the media. But while we were walking over there, he says, look, don't say anything about this. He said, but Barbara and I were playing tennis last night, and I got a crick in my neck, and I can't turn. And you can't play golf or baseball or anything where I got a crick. Yeah, you right. can't drive with, yep. a, you know, with a crick. And so uh, he says, go ahead and hit. And I get up, I'm nervous, you know, like when you're getting ready to get in the fight, your knees are shaking yep. and everything. And I just killed it on the same line as Weisskopf. <laughs> So Jack gets up, and this is one of the best athletic things I've ever seen. Here's a man who couldn't had a crick in his neck and couldn't turn, and he hit a little shit shot out there with Yancey over in the right rough. And and there's two balls on down there, uh, and Weisskopf just goes right to the front ball. So I walked to my heart went, you know, I've broken. So I walk up and I look at Jack. I said, they ain't mine. He goes like this. So he waited about 15, 20 seconds, you know. And he said, hey, Weiss, you going to play today or not? <laughs> <laughs> so he, Weiss cop, walks over to that front ball. He comes storming back. Now, the only time I ever met Tom Weisskopf was when we met on that tee. We shook hands. Mm -hmm. After that, we never. He never said a word to me that in eighteen holes. <laughs> so you I drove him once, yeah. and that was it. Yeah, <laughs> and exactly. Yeah, top, top American amateur. And I tell you what, that was one of the greatest athletic uh, achievements I've ever seen in my whole career. In basketball, football, baseball, it didn't make any difference. Mm -hmm. He played eighteen holes in pain. Yeah, you can't do anything. Yeah. You can't sleep. You can't do anything can't, with exactly a right. tight yeah. neck. I feel like you just have the most <laughs> absurd stories, and they're all true. Yeah. And it's like, who needs that memorabilia? You got all the memories. So, yeah. and if memorabilia makes you stick to the facts a little bit. Well, so. how, many, how many times have you been on Air Force One? Huh? How many times have you been on Air Force One? One. It was one. I thought I thought I remember like four presidencies or something. No. Who, one. who took you on Air Force One? Uh, Ed Farmer. <laughs> Farmio got arrested. So yeah. Old. Okay. I love that guy. Yeah. We all what a him. what a great man he was. I'll tell you one thing right now. He's one of the meanest guys. He was a two for one guy. You hit one of his guys, he's gonna get two of yours. Mm -hmm. Love that. Yes, and Drysdale was like that too. Drysdale started that two for one club, you know, with pitchers. Do you, Do you think baseball misses that a little bit, like that uh, the two for one, or you know, like pitchers standing up policing themselves? Do you wish there was more of that in the game today? Yeah, Contact. I do. Yeah, yeah, I do. I, I I believe in the codes that we yeah. had to play by. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if we had a seven or eight run lead, you know, in the seventh inning, uh, you didn't steal a base. Yeah, you know, mm -hmm. and you didn't swing three and zero. Oh. Okay, you know, it yep. was it was like that. These I don't blame these guys. 
the players. Mm -hmm. I blame the agents. Uh, baseball today has turned into an agent's game. You know, uh, I think the combined salaries of Scott Boris Stable last year was a billion two hundred million. It's a little bit of money. As I said, when I came in, it was uh, six thousand dollars was the minimum. Ted Williams and I used to talk a lot. You know, when mm -hmm. I was playing with the Red Sox, and Ted turned my career around. There's no question about that. And by that, I mean. We were talking one day, and he said, Hawk, he says, you got some of the strongest hands I've ever seen on a bat. He says, but you don't know how to hit. And yeah. he was right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah. That's what he talking about, Ted. He goes, that batter's box. He said, that batter's box is yours. You can go anywhere in that batter's box you want to go. If you want to stand on top of the plate, or if you want to stand back in the back corner, or if you want to stand up in front, like mm -hmm. Willie Horton used to. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Willie was a match. Alex used to do that. <laughs> and it, for some reason, it registered with me. And then I boiled it down to try to beat pitchers arm side. If it's a left-hander, try to beat them. I'm a right-handed here. If it's a left-hander, try to beat them to right field. If it's a right-hander, I couldn't hit Jim Palmer with a tennis racket. <laughs> And after Ted talked to me, I used to move right up on top of the plate. I mean, this far from the plate. Mm -hmm. And I've talked to pitchers, Hall of Famers. They don't like a right-handed pitcher nope. does not like a guy, right-handed hitter standing on top of the plate. It's uncomfortable for them. They, they've got to tighten that breaking ball yep. up, you know, yep. and a slider, you know. And after Ted told me that we were playing in Baltimore, it was the first time I did it against Palmer. And Andy Etcheberry was a catcher. And Andy says, Whoa, whoa. Because they, you know, they study and where mm -hmm. you, they know where you're supposed to be in the box standing. And all of a sudden, Palmer looks in. And he says, Hawk, you better get your ass off that plate. And I told Andy, I said, You go out there and tell that son of a bitch, if he hits me, I'm going to break his arm. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm in it. <laughs> I know you did. <laughs> I, t I, t I told Andy, I, you tell him I'll wait on him after the game and I'll break his arm. After the game? You're not charging the mound? I never charged the mound one time because okay. uh, what are you going to do? I don't know. Oh, uh, hold me back? <laughs> yeah. You can't do anything. Mm -hmm. I used to wait to the guy. If I was that upset with a pitcher, I'd wait till after the game. I'd go to this clubhouse, wait for him to come out, and then I'd beat the shit out of him. <laughs> that happened? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. How many, all right. So then how many fights did you get that are off the field? So they're just assault. So how many fights did you get in after a after game? a game or in your career? Probably six, seven. Six seven fights. What was like the most memorable? Like what was the angriest you were at a pitcher and, and why, I guess? Was it all just like, hey, they're just brushing you back? Or? Actually, it was the first time that I that I did that. I was really hot, uh, but it actually wasn't a pitcher. We were we got into a fight with uh, the Phillies farm team. I was an Ole in in the New York Penn League, mm -hmm. and uh, they had a big bonus boy that we had squared off, so to speak, in uh, in, in the fight. Mm -hmm. And I had him down on the ground and it was pounding him, you know. Okay. <laughs> and Andy Simonick was the manager and he comes over and he grabs me. He says, all right, he's had enough. So he pulls me <laughs> off. And I, I, he hadn't had enough as far as I was concerned. Okay. Yeah. So I waited on him after the game and, uh, and uh, he came out and we went at it again. And uh, I got that reputation. Yeah. You know. Mm -hmm. I only got hit nine times in my whole career. With a pitch? With a pitch. And any of do you think what percentage of those were intentional or just guys in Oh, no, there were a couple because yeah. of the code. Yeah. 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 You know, we were playing the Oakland Club in, in Fenway. Mm -hmm. And Chuck Dobson, the big 6'5 right hander, threw hard, good curveball, great stuff, you know. Mm -hmm. And Dauber was a good friend of mine, you know, he was. So we're playing them and got to be either in the seventh or eighth inning. And we're down a couple of runs. And I come to the plate with two men on. And Dauber, I'm sitting on this curveball, mm -hmm. which is a crazy thing to do because if he throws one up and in, you're going to catch it right here. You yeah. know? But I was sitting on this curveball. And uh, sure enough, here he threw me a good curveball 
down and away. And I went out and hooked it over everything there, you know, the green monster. And we beat him. So mm-hmm. after the game was over, we go to this bar where all the players went. Dauber comes over to me and he says, Hawk, he says, you know, I can't allow that. I said, Dauber, I know that. I said, I do what you got to do. Can't, can't allow what exactly? You didn't hit him a bomb. He had to get his revenge. Hit, hit, <laughs> hit his big, good curveball. Okay. Now, if he hung it, no problem. Uh, okay, I see what you're saying. If he hung yeah. it, you know, yeah. it's, it's, then it's his fault. Not, right. But I hit his good curveball. And I said, Dauber, do what you got to do. And sure enough, the next time we played him and he's pitching out in Oakland, first pitch, you got me right in the ribs. <laughs> And I just dropped a bat and went to first base. That's that's the code. <laughs> that's the code. Yeah. And exactly. you can't do that anymore. It's I, gotten to be such a soft game. Uh, it, you l- know. L- let me ask you this. What do you think uh, you're watching or listening or following the White Sox regularly still, correct? Yeah. What do you think of all these different lineups and how often they're resting guys? And th- I mean, the injuries are one thing because if you're hurt, you're hurt. But it's like, oh, we got to get you on the kind of rest on the back end of a du- double. Whatever order. Tony La Russa wants to do is okay with me. You got to be in that dugout. Mm-hmm. I mean, you got to be in that dugout in that clubhouse, you know. And Tony, the only guy that's on the one other guy has won more games than he's won. And he's only, what, this is 34th year manager and 35th year? So, something like that, yeah. He's only been fired one time. And you're talking to the guy, the asshole who fired him. <laughs> so you you wouldn't fire him right now? I didn't fire Tony when I was there uh, because he was a bad manager. And the reason I fired him is going to stay with me and him. I'll go to my grave with it. So there are certain things, you know, that uh, that's the reason that I'm not, I don't, I'm thinking about doing a book, and but that'll never be in there. That's I almost a, feel like you should do a 10 part Netflix series with all your stories. You should. <laughs> like an hour, an episode of you. There was like that. I've had Bernie want me to do, yeah. what do they call it? Uh, what, what's the show? What's the, what the word they use? The podcast. Podcast. Yeah. yeah that's, that's what, what we're doing is. right now. Yeah. We're doing a podcast. Is this a podcast? This is a podcast. This is a podcast. Yeah. yeah. But Hawk. Thanks again. Yeah, thank this, you, Hawk. This was spectacular. So it's great to finally meet you. Thanks for for meeting us out here. Yeah, it's it's been a pleasure, and uh, we'll do this again soon. Thank you, and uh, go White Sox. Yes, after we uh, go to the playoffs, maybe I'll talk to you guys again. I love that. Let's do it.